Active learning means different things to different people. In this video, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges of active learning and give you a roadmap for creating effective active learning experiences. If this is your first time on my channel, hey, what's up? I'm a cognitive scientist who studies learning and reasoning. And I really wanna help you understand the research on learning so that you can teach others and teach yourself more effectively. So if you're into it, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification and check out all my other stuff. But listen to this video first. What is active learning? Well, there are lots of definitions that we might use, but let's start with the simplest. Active learning is not passive learning. So what is passive learning? Well, essentially passive learning is lectures. Passive learning, the idea behind passive learning is that the teacher is trying to take a bunch of information, take like a bucket of information and dump it into the student's head. So it's usually a one-way street from the teacher to the student. With active learning, the student is more engaged in constructing their own knowledge with the support and guidance of the teacher. The result is a lot more interaction between the student and teacher. So even given this extremely broad definition, the research is pretty clear that active learning techniques uh, are better than passive learning techniques. So students understand concepts more deeply, they remember more of what they hear, and overall they just perform better, whether it's on a test or on a project or what have you. Now the idea here is that getting students actively thinking about the material in, in, in a sense tells the brain that the material is important and helps the brain to uh, kind of connect it and integrate it with what the student uh, is learning or already knows. But there are some wrinkles to active learning, which is what we're gonna to get to in a moment. There are two major challenges when it comes to active learning. First, there's really not that many forms of passive learning. It's basically just lectures, but there's a lot of forms of active learning. For instance, free recall, problem solving, group work, test taking, self-explanations, hands-on activities, project-based learning, contrasting cases, teaching other people, worked examples, flashcards, mind maps, games, etc. Someone has called all of these active learning at some point. The other issue is that active learning involves a lot more decision-making. With passive learning, there's almost no decisions at all. For instance, one of my statistics teachers in high school literally put in a 45 minute video every class um, and just sat there grading papers while we watched the video, right? So there's, there, weren't, there wasn't any decision making going on as long as the VCR was working, you know, she was good. But let's say you wanna do group work. You have to answer a whole series of questions. You know, how many students are there to a group? What kinds of questions are you gonna give the students? Um, when do you intervene and what do you say? When are you gonna use whole class instruction and, and what is that instruction gonna look like? This makes active learning a lot more challenging than passive learning to employ in practice. So to help us think about this, I wanna break things down into three different families of active learning techniques. First, organizing your knowledge. Second, recalling your knowledge, and third, practicing a skill. So let's talk about the first one first. The difference between someone who knows a lot about something and someone who knows only a little about something isn't just about the amount of stuff that they know. It's also about how they organize what they know. So experts have what are called organized knowledge structures. So Let's take a bird expert or an ornithologist, if you're being fancy. If you could peek inside this expert's head, the way they think about birds is probably something like this. So there's structure, there's hierarchy, okay? But let's take a bird novice like me. If we were to peek inside my head, my understanding of birds is something more like this. It's a bird. A big part of effective learning is developing the right kind of organizational structure for the new knowledge that's coming in. 
On to the second family of active learning techniques. So one of the most effective ways of remembering information is trying to remember that information. And here I want to reference a study on free recall. The basic setup goes something like this. Researchers asked two groups of students to remember the same material. The researchers had one group restudy or reread the material over again after reading it once. They had the other group pull out a blank sheet of paper and try to remember everything they could about what they had read. Later, everyone got the same test. So which group did better? Well, it turned out the students who used the blank sheet of paper, who were working hard to remember what they had read, that performed better, like a lot better. The students that just reread what they had already read performed worse. The act of pulling something out of your head, of trying to remember something, that turns out to be a really effective way of remembering that thing. Something similar comes up when making predictions. So humans are expert rationalizers. It's very easy for them to accept an explanation that sounds reasonable, or sometimes even unreasonable. Imagine you're six years old again. If a teacher came in and told you that a heavy object and a light object fall at the same rate, you might think, hmm, yeah, that sounds right. But if they told you that a heavy object and a light object fall at different rates, you also might think, hmm, yeah, that sounds right too. But if the teacher asks you to make a prediction first, it short circuits that rationalization process. This is especially true if you write down your prediction, then you have to commit to it. Um, it becomes a lot more obvious when you're wrong and you're liable to pay more attention to the correct explanation. Um, this is part of the reason why you ask students for their predictions first before showing them the correct answer, the correct way of thinking about it. The third family of active learning techniques is perhaps a bit more obvious, practicing a skill. So if you want students to get good at a skill, they, they actually have to practice that. Um, I can tell you about riding a bike until I'm blue in the face, but that's not gonna make you ride a bike any better. Uh, you really just need to practice riding a bike. Now, there's more to say about the nuances of the right kinds of practice, but that's, that's for another video. If an active learning activity doesn't do one of these three things, it's probably not that great. So let's talk about word searches for a second. If you think about it, word searches seem like an active learning activity. There's a lot of brain power that's focused on finding those words and finding those letters. But I'm not in love with word searches as learning tools. It doesn't help students organize their knowledge. It doesn't ask them to recall or apply their knowledge in any way. And they're not getting any practice at any key skill. You know, unless you want them to become better at word searches, which, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a very useful skill, but maybe you're into that, I don't know. Um, but aside from that, it doesn't seem like word searches are really helping you at all. So this is a kind of bad active learning activity. The student is exerting cognitive effort. They're trying to use their heads to do something, but that something isn't helping them learn. Really good active learning activities incorporate all three of these techniques. Suppose you're a geology teacher. Now, different rocks have different properties and you want students to understand those properties and, you know, reason about them. What you might do is something like the following. Step one, bring some rocks into class and ask the students what they observe about the rocks. Help the students create a list of properties that different rocks might have and you know, explain and discuss what kind of geological forces create those, those, those kinds of rocks. So here, the student starts off by making observations, then the teacher clarifies and systematizes these observations, as well as filling in any gaps that the students missed. Next class, make 10 stations of rock pairs and have students go from station to station, comparing the rocks to each other, trying to determine whether they're the same or not and why. 
Then you might ask them to get into groups to compare their answers to each other, correcting any mistakes, before finally giving students the uh, correct answers. Then go over the correct classifications, discussing how different forces give rise to different kinds of rocks. So here, students have to recall what they learned last class and extend it to new kinds of rocks, as well as consider the geological forces at work. A week later, you might give students a test. Now this test is gonna do two different things. It's gonna ask them to recall different kinds of rocks and their properties in an open-ended way, and it's going to ask students to apply their knowledge. So for instance, a question like, you know, 50 million years ago, there was a dormant volcano, and then over the next 10 million years, a glacier moved and covered the volcano, then the glacier retreated. What kinds of rocks would we expect to find here? So this kind of test, it gives you information about how much the students have retained over the last week and is itself a solid learning experience because students have to pull their previous knowledge out of their heads and apply it to new situations. A week after that, you might ask students to extend their knowledge even further by asking them to think about Mars or another hypothetical planet and the geological forces that go on there to try to reason out what kinds of rocks would be produced from these forces. Note here, you want students to be able to reason both ways, from the geological forces at play to the kinds of rocks that will result from those forces, and reasoning from the rocks to the geological forces at play. So in essence, these are both skills you want them to have, and the more that they practice them, the better they're going to get. Now, this is not a perfect series of learning activities by any means, but it's a reasonable place to start. And I hope that you're starting to see how integrating a bunch of different active learning activities over the course of several weeks is better than the passive learning alternative of just giving students a bunch of lectures over those weeks. Students are going to retain more material, they're going to understand more, and they're going to be able to apply their new knowledge to novel and interesting situations. If you want to make this video into a more active learning experience, for yourself, I want you to answer two questions in the comments. First, what was the thing that most surprised you about this video? Uh, it can be something that maybe you didn't know before, or maybe you disagreed with, or maybe that uh, just kind of, yeah, came out of nowhere that you didn't, you didn't think was coming. Um, and two, the second thing I want you to do is to give an example of a bad active learning experience or a good active learning experience and explain why you think it was good or bad. So this is going to help you think further about active learning experiences. If you wanna see more videos like this, please subscribe, click the bell notification so you never miss a video when it's uploaded. Um, as usual, there's references to some of the research that I talked about in the description, and that's it. Until next time, peace.